morning prayer in the service of the Lord's Day, third Sunday of Lent, the 20th of March, 2022, Community Church of Syosset. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our hearts attend to God.
O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call upon your name. Let us worship God. to stop making your father's house a marketplace. Save us from the chaos of divided loyalties. And the worship of strange gods. Save us, God of truth and mercy, from making God in our own likeness. And the slavery of self-centeredness. O Jesus Christ, Savior of all who lose their way, O healing spirit, Power who renews the world. We need you, God of truth and mercy. Together in this company of conscience, let us search our hearts. Friends, be assured of God's pardon. Hear the words of the Apostle. He is the source of our life. 
in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Our lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, the parable of the fig tree. Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've come looking for on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, all well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture to our understanding.
Here we have scripture readings which lead us on the one hand to God's greatness, his glory, how great thou art. On the other hand, we have scripture that's leading us to the ideas of mercy and patience. Now, think about people you need to forgive. And by that, I mean people who have been offensive, annoyed you, bothered you, represent a threat to you, undermined you, backstabbed you. Can I go on? No. Can you go on in your mind? Are the the faces of the people beginning to take a little shape and a little form in your consciousness? Can we have mercy? Now, on the one hand, we may look at the scripture reading and say, oh, well, the fig tree is the people of Israel, right? And they have not been bearing fruit lately, and so we got to get rid of it so that we can, uh, you know, take, you're taking up too much space. You're, you know, too much, you're consuming too much air in the garden, so to speak. We can take it that way. Can we also take our own lives, your life, my life, our interior lives, the lives that we live in the world, can we also look at that as the garden, our context of living, right? Our situation in life and see ourselves as the tree, the fig tree within it. I think that's reasonable too. Now, have we always borne the fruit we ought to bear? I have not. And that is the truth. I believe that all human beings move through seasons of their lives, some of which bear great fruit. Not great fruit. Great fruit. <laughs> I like great fruit too. But we're not talking about a grapefruit tree. Some of which bear great fruit, and some of which bear no fruit at all. And fig trees in Palestine are kind of at the edge of their range, especially in the Galilee. You can't always count on them bearing fruit, but they were very valuable because when they dried, they were the the way food of of people walking around. They had lots of calories and they tasted good and we all love figs, right? So, uh, you you know, so having a fig tree was a good thing, but honestly, they weren't as reliable as they are in other parts of the world, depending on where they happen to be. And they didn't have the modern varieties that we have now that are more reliable. So the gardener came and he saw it didn't bear fruit one year. Okay, to be expected, two years. This isn't good, three years. Let's cut this thing down. No fruit. Okay, I've been waiting. Nothing. Now let's put something else there. But the gardener says, wait a minute. Let's give it another chance. Let's dig around it. Let's put some fertilizer on it. Let's see what we can do. To which the Landlord said, all right, but if not next year, (laughs) put a little pressure on the tree and the gardener, right? Can we imagine that Jesus in the gospel lessons is cultivating our tree, our lives, the way we live in the garden in order to bear fruit? Can we imagine that? Can we imagine, too, that while our failure is real, everyone's failures here are real, mine the first. Our failures are real. We are subject to the objective judgment upon our lives. And Jesus says, wait, let's not cut it down. Let's cultivate it. Let's do better. 
And so we might, if we are looking at understanding the garden as being our situation in lives and the fig tree being you know, our lives as it produces fruit in the world and we can imagine Jesus cultivating it, we might ask ourselves the question, well, since Jesus has been cultivating my tree, my life, how well have I been doing in bearing fruit? You see, the pressure of judgment is not released, right? It wasn't like the, gar like the owner of the vineyard said, oh, well, if you're going to cultivate it a little bit and fertilize it some, then I'll, I'll, I just won't pay attention to it anymore. Uh, that, that wasn't the message. Let's come back next year. Let's look again. As we relate to our God and the reality that our lives are objectively productive, right? And they are. Let us not confuse the mercy for which Jesus advocates and the demand that we do even better than before. Right? They are two parts of the balance. If you heard of a person who was living a publicly and objectively sinful life, I don't know, a gangster, uh, you, you know, uh, a Bernie Madoff type, I don't know, somebody who's li living in a bad way, and they said to you, well, I'm just going to wait until I'm on my deathbed and then I'll say sorry and everything is cool. Would, how does that sit with you? <laughs> that doesn't sound right, does it? It doesn't sound right. But yet, on the other hand, if you have a person who's struggling in some way, you know, a, a person who is conscious of their faults and keeps at it, you know, Oh, take your pick of faults, right? And they're working at it. How do you feel about that person? A little more inclined to mercy yourself? Now, look into your own life. Are you okay with not bearing fruit in the world in the way that you ought to bear it? Because each of us knows the tasks before us. Each of us has a unique calling from God, right? No, no, we're not all expected to bear the same fruit in the world. We're not expected to all do the same good, all the same things. We're not even expected to all have the same opinions or notions. But each of us has within ourselves a calling to do better. To be, if perhaps we're a bit rigid, to be a bit more open-hearted. To be, if we're a bit lax, to sturdy up a bit. If we are a bit stingy, to be a bit more generous. If we are spendthrifts, to be a little bit more thoughtful, disciplined. If we are standoffish, to be more loving. We all have before us the opportunities to grow in the way each of us is called. And that way opens up for all of us. Every one of us here knows that there is a difference between how we're performing and what our values are, right? And something, ought to sh something sh needs to shift. Either our values need to shift or, whether, or our performance needs to shift, but otherwise we won't bring ourselves into that balance of living well. So with the fig tree, we have this parable that says our production, our productivity, how we perform in life, how we live our lives, how righteous we are, how upright we are, according to our own calling, continues to be an you know, objective subject of judgment. We will stand before God and our lives will be written into eternity. And likewise, we have a Savior Jesus who even after many years of not getting there, what does he say? Let's try more. 
Let's cultivate more. Let's be more. Give me the chance to make a difference in this life. Can we plead with our God to make our lives better, more upright? Can we devote ourselves to living according to the rectitude to which we are uniquely called in our situation? This is a question we should ask ourselves. And I don't know about you, I sometimes have trouble forgiving myself. Am I the only one here who, who has trouble forgiving myself when I fail? I do, I do. So, how do we train ourselves to be more merciful to ourselves? Be more merciful in our judgment. Well, first of all, by remembering that guess what? I'm not God. God may own my garden, but I ain't God. God judges, not me. God knows my motivations, my circumstances, my strengths and weaknesses more deeply, clearly, profoundly, everything else than I do. God is omniscient, right? That's the first, is humility. The second is practice. Has anybody here ever had to forgive a child? Uh -huh. Anybody here ever have to forgive another important person in their life? Or a boss? Or a co-worker? This is where we practice. Now, if a co-worker just stabbed you in the back, um, and wrecked your reputation, how likely you are you to want to forgive them? Not very, okay? And yet, this is what we are to do. How do we cultivate this practice of mercy in our lives? And yes, this comes back to how great God is, okay? Promise. How does this cultivate mercy how do we cultivate this kind of mercy in our life, hard mercy? Well, I would suggest we take baby steps. How about forgiving that person in traffic who's having a bad day or is showing us a bad attitude? I like going back to traffic. How about that person on the supermarket line who's be being unpleasant? I like going to supermarket lines. Are these places where we can practice mercy. Easier, right? But yet we train ourselves to say, I want to be Jesus in this person's life. I want to be the person who, by the power of my example, helps them, cultivates them in goodness. Remember that as Christians, we are called literally to be Christos, the anointed ones, like Jesus was anointed. We are to be Jesus to our neighbor, right? But nowhere do you find in scripture where we are to be God to our neighbor or judge to our neighbor, right? So what's the difference? For us, to put Jesus' lessons into practice with our relationships with other people, particularly the practice of mercy, right? Particularly the practice of mercy. We bring a sense of the sacred and divine into their lives and into our lives. This is key for being Christian, to be Christ for our neighbor. Not God the judge, but Jesus the one who mercifully helps the other. You'll notice it didn't just start out with, oh God, just leave it alone for another year. No, let me cultivate it, right? Let me dig around it, fertilize it. Because this is what we are to do in the world, literally as Christ's members, as his flesh on this earth, as his hands in this world, to cultivate upright living, primarily through our own example, primarily. 
if we live this kind of life, avoiding the judgment, but doing the work, we find ourselves being increasingly able to show mercy where it's needed by doing the work that mercy demands. We need to look into our individual circumstances to do that. Yet, this is what's before us. Now, when we live with that kind of humility, putting aside judgment, lifting up the work demanded by mercy, what we are doing is praising the great God who calls us into the fullness of life. So this Lent, as we prepare to celebrate the confusing, bewildering, awesome, inspiring miracles of Christ's sacrifice, death, resurrection, a new life, we prepare ourselves best by making a particular effort to practice the work that mercy demands. And in this world of ours, our primary tool for making peace is living mercifully. You may wonder, what can I do to stop the war in Ukraine? I don't know. But I, I know you can put articles in the bucket that will get over there that have, you know, pharmaceuticals and things like that because we feel, merci we feel like we want to be merciful to those who are suffering. Pick your way. Find your own way. Find your way to uniquely yourself. Honor not only God's vision of your tr full truth, but also honoring the mercy that Jesus is showing you in the cultivation of your lives. Friends, that work praises a God who is great and calls us into glory. May God bless our reading of Holy Scripture.
Friends, are there prayers this morning? Patty. Ah, oh, for Nancy Wilson's family. Almighty God, we lift them up to you in their grief. We pray, of course, for the repose of Nancy's soul. And remember those who are left in grief. We pray that your company of friends will gather around them and comfort them in their needs. We pray to the Lord. Amen. Are there other prayers? Well, I know there are, but they might not be shared at the moment. We would remember, of course, the, uh, the family of Ray Gebhardt, uh, Lauren's extended family, and uh, just lift up the whole family in prayer, praying that they will comfort one another and that they will know the mercy of God's love as they share and celebrate that life together. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Let us pray this morning for peace in this world. We pray that the spirit of mercy will grow and expand. We leave the judgment to God. We do our best not to let our hearts be poisoned by our understandable reactions of anger, disgust. We pray instead to let the need of those people who are killed and those people who are displaced. The news says now it's maybe 10 million are displaced by this war. We can only imagine the multiplication of this tragedy. Pray for the conversion of those who perpetrate the wrong. Pray for those with the strength, especially those who aid those who are in need. Pray for an end to this warring madness. We pray that those in leadership may find solutions that do not involve violence they solve the problems of their nations around conference tables. That men and women in suits and briefcases may replace those with guns and bombs. We pray to the Lord. Lord Almighty God, we pray for your church throughout the world. We pray that we may become more united in our efforts for peace. More effective in our efforts for helping those who are harmed in war. We pray to the Lord. And we pray for your church throughout the world that we may all be more true to your mission. We pray for another year. Cultivate us, Lord. Fertilize us. Help us to bear fruit according to the mission you have given to each of your congregations. We pray to the Lord. We pray for our nation, all of our leaders. We pray that you will inspire them to be leaders of conscience, to seek you and your dictates within their spirits to form and convert them, to aid them and strengthen them in your ways, that the world may be safer on their efforts, we pray to the Lord. Amen. We pray, too, that we shall be more merciful to one another and that we will learn your ways just as this new spring is upon us that we may find new life in living according to Jesus' ways. We pray to the Lord. Amen. And for the prayers which we hold in the silence of our hearts, the prayers that are private, 
for the prayers that do not yet have words, the prayers that we have promised others. Stir them up, Lord, and help us to lift our hearts to you in this company of conscience together. So we are bold to pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, Glory forever. and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. God is near. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to exhort you, please, to continue contributing to our bucket for Ukraine and to our red bucket. We have two buckets for you, and we hope we shall continue filling them. We have so far collected in cash $2,170 for the relief of the victims of the war in Ukraine. So please do what you can. Also, please do join us this Wednesday evening uh, as part of our community Lenten services at 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock. And if you would like to write letters to your officials in D.C. and elsewhere regarding the war in Ukraine, please email me and I can send you templates or templates, I don't know how to pronounce it still, uh, to this end. So thank you all and... Enjoy the week. Thank you, Robert. I'm sure it's potato patata. Um, on Wednesday, of course, we are looking forward to it. We hope to have a good turnout. It's a, as you know, it's a, maybe you don't, it's a multi-church event. So uh, you, you, you know how these Wednesday night things are in Protestant churches. Not many people show up. But uh, we are hoping that uh, we'll, we'll have some kind of a turnout. Anybody who has a yen to sing in the choir as a one-shot deal, um, you, you know, uh, show up at 6.15. There'll be some choir members from some of the other churches showing up. So uh, we, but we also need people in the pews as well as the few visitors. Since a lot of the churches are around Moira's area on the South Shore, there'll be uh, uh, maybe a fewer people uh, that would show up normally so, uh, to these. So uh, come out if you can. And uh, so we look forward to having it, and of course it will be streamed, um, and a, uh, and we'll also be doing have a have a, a link uh, following. So thank you all. God bless you. Uh, a, a Wednesday Bible study. It's ongoing, so uh, be sure uh, that at noon. And think about whether or not you would like to have an evening Bible study. So far, there's been a suggestion that perhaps Wednesday evening. Uh, could be a better time. Of course, it wouldn't fall on the same night as our uh, Board of Stewards meeting, but uh, that's a possibility as well for a Bible study. So think about it and uh, hope to hear more from it, as well as what we might do as far as offerings after the coffee hour. We could do things like uh, afterthoughts on the sermon, or we could talk about a book we're reading or current events. Um, maybe not all about just, you know, the, the, you know, our daily lives, but, you know, something that brings spiritual nourishment to ourselves. So uh, for after coffee hour, uh, starting after Easter, we look forward to doing that. And please do mark off Good Friday, okay? Uh, we're, we're, we're not going to, we'll let you know where the Holy Thursday service will be um, that, that, that I know I'll be participating in. Uh, but we'll have a Good Friday service and an Easter Sunday sunrise service on the beach. You'll get directions. And also uh, an Easter, uh, Easter service here. So are there any questions or thoughts? Or did I leave anything out? God bless you all and have a blessed week. <laughs>